Okay, sorry. Uh, my name is Max Ogden. Actually, the last time I spoke at NodeConf was directly after Felix. So this is the second time consecutively that I've had to give a talk after a German doing a really impressive live coding, live coding gen talk. So I always feel intimidated at NodeConfs. Um, I want to do a talk that kind of will illuminate some of the stuff that's glossed over quite often. Um, technically, this is like a nice introduction or addendum to the previous talks, because um, it talks about this question. Um, how does binary work in JavaScript? And then other things like multidimensional data, newer concepts for fast things. And one of the core questions is, what makes Node fast? People say Node's fast. I've heard from a lot of people that, oh, Node, that's like the faster Rails, which is a crazy conception of Node, but people, people perceive it that way. Um, and so hopefully, I can talk about why it's fast. Um, and V8 is really why it's fast, and that's why Node exists. Um, thank you to the V8 team. And the V8 works on a small hexagon. This is RAM. Imagine you have an 8 gigabyte uh, allocation of RAM on your computer. You'll get, this is roughly, but you'll get about a gigabyte or a couple gigabytes, but not all of your RAM. V8 won't take over all the RAM on your machine. Um, it has a very small heap. But if you say you want to maximize all your RAM, um, you can allocate binary data in the rest of the RAM. So this is something really important to think about when you're writing node programs and you care about efficiency um, and speed. Um, and so you know, everybody knows about these things in JavaScript, because they've been around since the beginning. Um, all of our little friends here, the different brackets, um, numbers, strings, objects, most of the things. I left out a bunch, but these are the main ones. Um, so there's no raw binary data format in standard JavaScript. You usually have to do things like either base64 in code or something like that. Um, and the benefit is it's nice, it's high level. Binary data structures are hard to use. Um, and it, they're dynamic. You, can, uh, you don't have to resize. Like you never have to use malloc to get new memory to add a new key to an object. Um, it's all just you know, a high level abstraction. Um, but sometimes it's nice to have low level abstractions um, because converting between is where a lot of the slow bits are. Um, so these things are inside the V8 heap. So they're in the small hexagon. Um, and you can have, you know, objects are usually pretty small, so you can have like millions of objects within a gigabyte of memory. Um, and now, as of the last few years, um, there's ways to store raw binary data. So you have buffers in Node, and then in the browser, but also in Node, since they're on the same engine, um, you have typed arrays and array buffers. And um, the raw binary data, don't be afraid of them, play with them, um, don't reinvent the wheel. There's all sorts of binary formats that you can use. Uh, don't write your own binary format and try to popularize it. There's probably somebody that's already written a binary, binary format that works for your use case. But the cool thing is you can now read binary formats without converting to non-binary data structures, which is really fast. Um, there's some caveats with binary data structures. They're generally slow to initialize. Um, in Node, they make that faster. Um, but I'll get to the details. However, once you have them initialized, they're super fast and memory efficient because uh, you can type your data. You can store certain types of integers or floats or different size data. Uh, you can be very memory efficient, and they're really fast for read-write operations. Um, but they can use all your RAM. If you, uh, for th that means two things. One is you can allocate a lot of memory and run out of memory, because you could allocate gigabytes of, you could create a 20 gigabyte buffer if you wanted. Um, but also, there, these things here, the buffers and type trees and array buffers, are in the big hexagon. So if, imagine that you had a 32 gigabyte server. The small hexagon would still be one gigabyte. The big one would be 31 gigabytes. So you want to be able to take advantage of the big hexagon here. Um, so it's really important that um, I think you should be as familiar with these things as you should be with these things. They're, I think, of equal importance, especially in Node. And the browsers are adding these support for things, these things. They're uh, typed arrays are in a lot of browsers now. So what are the differences? Um, so they're actually introduced around the same time. Um, Node introduced buffers around the same time as browsers got typed arrays. And browsers got typed arrays because of uh, WebGL. So uh oh, um, when WebGL was introduced, uh, they needed binary storage for game assets, um, for storing textures, vertex buffers, all sorts of things you need to be really fast, because in a game, you only have 17, 17 milliseconds to draw a frame. And you need to do that 60 times a second. And accessing data needs to be super fast. So, Thank you, WebGL, because we have, because of that, there's a standard that was pushed through that got into browsers that gives us raw binary data, and that's awesome for speed. And it's a nice tool to have. I can't really imagine writing anything cool in JavaScript before 
binary was a thing that you could use easily and fast. Um, typed arrays are zeroed when you initialize them because you don't want to have uh, memory that was left over by somebody else get allocated to you in a web page. <laughs> um, but in Node, since you are in control of the whole process, it's fine. So Node actually doesn't zero fill. You get, if you allocate a buffer, it'll be filled with data from whoever used that data last. Um, but so typed arrays are a little bit slower to initialize. That's why Node doesn't use typed arrays. Um, typed arrays will never not be zero filled. Node buffers will never be zero filled. So they're incompatible, but they're very similar. Um, and so typed arrays are just a different API. So whereas buffers are a single thing, um, you create a buffer and you could read and write from it. Um, typed arrays are split into two things. There's typed arrays are actually just the view that you work with, but the actual buffer is called an array buffer. And it's, it's a thing that doesn't really have any API on it, but it's an object you can pass around that's basically all the RAM. But then you create a typed array on top of that, and that typed array is just a view. So if you want to write integers, you create an int array on an array buffer, and you could write integers. If you want to write float data into the same array buffer, you create a float, in, a float array. And you can pick the, the bit size for the floats or ints. Um, so typed arrays and array buffers together are kind of like node buffers. They're comparable. Like the pair on one is the same as buffers on the other. Um, and buffers, you can write and read the different types. Um, there's just a bunch of different methods you can call. Um, so it's just two different APIs designed at the same time with different performance characteristics and security things in mind, but they're essentially the same thing. However, um, well, okay, so the thing is, don't use buffers for everything because um, there's trade-offs, right? So if you convert from a buffer to a JS object, like if you do buffer.toString, um, there's some things to keep in mind. Like UTF-8 can be really slow because it's complicated. Um, if you convert from a buffer to a string, it has to decode all the multi-byte characters and render them as UTF-8 characters. And if you don't need to do that, don't do it. For certain things, you do need to do that. Um, it's always faster to keep data in the buffer, in the binary form. So if you care about speed and not necessarily high-level API, you can think about keeping it in buffers as much as possible. Um, but it's usually way easier to work with if you have a JSON object, because you can add a new value, you can traverse a tree. Um, so there's, there's trade-offs. Here's a very concrete example. There's two modules on NPM. One's called split, one's called binary split. Split uses regexes and strings. So if you give it buffers, it converts everything to a string. And then uh, you can write it a stream, and you can give it like a new line character. And it'll emit to you all the lines in the stream that you give it. So what it does is it converts everything to strings, and then uses regex to split on new lines, and then emits each line to you. So that's really awesome, except um, it converts everything to a string. You can use regex, which is a nice high-level API. But if you only care about splitting, uh, if you care about speed and you don't need the full regex splitting, um, you can just use binary split, which doesn't convert from buffers. And all it does actually is it just t reads the buffer and then reads the decimal encoding for a new line. So you can give it, which is one zero in decimal. So it looks through buffers and looks for a consecutive one zero value, or a value that's one zero, and it knows that's a new line. Um, and then it just slices the buffer and slices a method on a buffer that's memory efficient, doesn't copy the buffer. So there's you know, two ways to skin a cat. One is higher level, better API. You could use regexps. The other one is optimized for speed, doesn't convert anything to strings, keeps it as buffers. So you know, they're both valid, um, but it's good to have your options. You would never skin a cat. I would never skin a cat. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, spay and neuter your cats. Uh, so OK, where is binary today in JavaScript? There's, it's in the browsers. It's WebSockets. You can get data as binary. Um, XHR, you can receive data as binary. You get array buffers back. File readers, you can read a file. Like you drag and drop a file, you can get a binary object. The nice thing about all of these is that they're super fast. All they do is they read the file from the, the OS and create a buffer, or sometimes stream of buffers or whatever. Um, so the nice thing is that uh, you have the option now. Before, you could only get XHR as a string response, but now you can get binary. You don't have to like base64 encode, um, which is slow. Um, web audio uh, is really awesome, because you need binary data for most audio things and video. Uh, like WebRTC um, uses binary for its video, but soon you'll be able to do arbitrary binary data streams peer to peer. So you could drop a file on your browser, send it peer to peer binary to another browser without converting it into something like Base64 or Message Pack. Um, so uh, there's also binary in Node. Um, for instance, like if you create an HTTP server and you send, even if you're sending like a text body, You'll, Node will parse it as a buffer. It doesn't convert it to string. If you want to convert it to string, you can, but Node doesn't do that because it's slow. 
the default for nodes to be as fast as possible. Also with FS, the nice thing about Node is that it gives you buffers for everything. Um, once you learn about buffers and streams, you can work with I.O. data from anywhere. So in Node Core, everything is actually a buffer. Um, because why would Node convert something to a string if you, they didn't? Because it can never know if you want it as a string. But you can always just call to string if you want to take on the cost of converting all the UTF-8 characters, et cetera. Um, crypto works with buffers. Um, you could also JSON parse buffers, which is really nice. So you don't have to parse a JSON string. You can parse a buffer version, a binary encoding of a JSON string. And it, it's a little more efficient. Um, However, because they're two different APIs, and this is really difficult because only recently, like in the last talk you saw using the same module on the client and the server, such an incredibly powerful pattern. Being able to have a proper package manager, and by proper I mean something where you can actually not have dependency hell, being able to have that on the browser is really important. However, unfortunately we have, because of this different priorities, we have binary, two different binary implementations um, that are incompatible. So you, you can't actually implement buffer semantics in Node on top of array buffers and typed arrays, because they're just fundamentally different in a few key ways. You can implement buffers on top of the JS object prototype, but then they're not backed by an actual binary store, it's, so it's really slow. So you can have compatibility, but you can't have speed. So to have compatibility and speed, you have to use this module, which is called BOPS, um, which is written by this guy Chris Dickinson, who is working on the JS Git project to implement all of Git in pure JavaScript, so you can clone repos into your browser without any C++ code or anything. Um, so it's binary operations. So the idea is, if you want to write a module that works in all JavaScript environments, um, that does binary data, and you want it to be as fast as possible, then use this. Don't, you, don't require a buffer. Don't use typed arrays. Use this library, um, and it'll work everywhere. That's the idea. So whereas um, you can create a new uint array, of length one, that's a typed array, or you can create a new buffer of length one. Um, that's like the client or the server code. The, third, the, the bottom bullet is how you would do it in BOPS. You would, uh, you would give it whatever your underlying binary storage is as x, and then you tell it at uh, write one to index zero. So that's putting a one into the first place in the array. So, but read the BOPS readme, because um, it, it explains it much more. Uh, better. <laughs> uh, then also, this is really cool. Once you have binary data, you can do really interesting things. Um, so uh, JavaScript doesn't have a good matrix or multidimensional data structure. Um, there's this thing that's slow, um, is creating a, a ton of JavaScript arrays. That's really slow. Um, it's a lot of overhead, and they're also allocated inside of the small hexagon, so you can't do things like if you wanted to load an entire PNG into a two-dimensional array, and you needed, imagine it's a million pixels, you have to create a million arrays uh, or something like that. Or you know, you'd have to get really tricky with your memory usage to not blow up V8. But if you want to put them in the big hexagon, you can virtualize an n-dimensional array on top of a typed array or any binary structure. So it works on buffers, it works on typed arrays. Um, this library called ND array means n-dimensional array. You can represent something like a table, like an Excel spreadsheet in an array, which is a one-dimensional thing. Um, you could but it's also n-dimensional, which means you can get crazier and crazier. You can, you can pick your dimension that you want, and it will attempt to optimize it. Um, it's written by this guy, Mikola Lysenko. I highly, highly recommend you read the readme on this. Um, it's just ND array on NPM. Um, he is a math PhD, and he works in computational geometry. And one of his goals is to take everything, uh, like in the linear algebra world and uh, a lot of math, they still use Fortran because Fortran has all the best math that was written by geniuses that nobody wants to touch. This guy's trying to write it all in JavaScript. Um, and JavaScript, it turns out, uh, is among the top languages for speed of pure math. Um, but the one thing it's lacking in is matrix math. Um, so he's been working on a lot of things to kind of bridge the gap for applications like scientific computing or numeric uh, JavaScript. Um, so you can require ND array, and you can give it a typed array, and then it gives you a, a, a thing that's a nice high-level API that's like you're working with a table of data, but under the hood, it's just working with a big buffer. Really, really cool module, and there's some really cool um, demos. So um, has anybody ever 3D printed ever, anything ever before or seen a 3D printer? So that, that's, that's an n-dimensional data structure. Um, it's three-dimensional. Um, so a, an Excel spreadsheet is two dimensions, and, and a 3D print is the three-dimensional data structure. So you, if you make a three-dimensional ND array, um, such as in this demo, uh-oh. Well, um, I have this Mario here. And uh, this was designed by an app I made by a, a kid who 
he said he spent three hours designing this Mario in this little voxel painter that I made. And he did a really good job, and so I wanted to take his artwork and print it out, because there's a printer that I have access to. And so I wrote this program that reads the voxels that this kid put into the Mario design, puts them into one typed array that's virtualized using ND arrays, the three-dimensional array. And then I, I read that three-dimensional data um, efficiently and generate an STL file, which is a common 3D printing format. It's like the CSV of 3D. Um, and then what you get, um, oh, the other cool thing is, once you have it in a three-dimensional structure, you have a really nice API. So this, this guy, McCola, he's the math PhD, he wrote a thing that smooths voxels. So if you view smooth, uh, well, my demo's not working because of the screen resize or something, but um, I, have a, I have it loaded into the MakerBot um, software. This is for 3D printing. These were generated by this web page in pure JavaScript. So this is the original version where I, I read through the ND array and I create a 3D model. But operating on the ND array, he applied this thing called surface nets, or also it's no, there's another method, uh, marching cubes. And these, these are actually developed for brain scans, because fMRIs, um, they take a voxel volume of your brain. So they can measure the density of your brain, and you get a point cloud. Voxels are basically just a point cloud. Um, so if you, you can't look at a bunch of dots, you want to see a surface. So there's the surface reconstruction algorithms. And if you have data in 3D, you can apply surface reconstruction algorithms from obscure scientific white papers. It, for my use case, I'm smoothing Mario to make him look less blocky. Um, <laughs> So thanks, science. Um, <laughs> but you can, you know, really cool stuff, and you can, so you can require these modules now because this guy's putting all his computational geometry stuff on NPM. Um, and I've, I 3D printed one of these, and they turn out really awesome. Um, so there's also uh, this, this demo I did, which is just a little STL viewer. And so this is just like putting 3D noise, um, smooth noise functions. It's used like in Minecraft to generate the terrain. This is generating two different regions of smooth noise that are actually continuous, um, and then rendering them, it's kind of like rendering a Minecraft level as um, uh, a STL. So this is just a little STL file viewer, um, and you can zoom out of it. And so I just have this like cube region. Um, this is an ND array visualized, essentially, as voxels. Um, and so it's really fun to play with these things, because thinking in 3D and JavaScript is a new concept, and it's really fun to mess around with. Um, and then this guy, uh, Hugh, Hugh Kennedy, I think the mouse is going a little bit crazy. Um, he's, he worked on this game for the last, uh, there's like 48 hour game building competitions called Ludum Dare. And he built this, which is a uh, continuous ND array. So when it comes off the screen, it only allocates enough of the, the level um, to show you on the screen efficiently. Kind of like Google Maps doesn't render the whole world, it only renders what you're looking at. Um, and this is a little game that he wrote using ND arrays that, it's a 2D ND array using a noise generator function um, that it can request more noise in tiles as you go down. So you, you can fall through this world and shoot the bad guys um, forever. It's like an infinite loading world, and um, it's, the code is only like that long for the whole world generation stuff because ND arrays are nice, nice to work with. Um, so the implications of this stuff um, are in Node. Like the reason that Node doesn't convert everything to string is because it wants to be fast. Um, but also, binary, um, it's really important to think about streaming when you're talking about binary, because you, there are certain formats that are streaming and certain ones that aren't. You don't always want to read 20 gigabytes of a file into memory before you can process it. It's really nice to be able to process as you get and not have to wait. Um, so streams, the kind of too long, didn't read version is, I.O. is really slow, CPU is really fast. So you, do, you want to be able to use your CPU stuff as fast as the I.O. comes in. You don't want to wait for the whole I.O. thing to come in. Um, don't wait for the whole thing to download, and then you get buffers, and if you want to convert the string, you can. Um, this is actually an a, a infographic based on a thing that the guy that wrote LevelDB gave as a presentation. It's numbers that every programmer should know. So four columns, and it's basically powers uh, or orders of magnitude. Um, this is CPU operations, like L2 cache and like um, really, really nanosecond, sub-nanosecond stuff. All of these operations here are one blue dot. The blue dot is RAM, so CPU and then RAM. So RAM is slower than CPU, but it's still pretty fast. All of these RAM operations are um, 10 microseconds, one of the green ones. The green ones is roughly network and SSD reads. Um, and then these ones are like network. This, all of these red ones are a round trip packet to the Netherlands from California. Um, so you know, this is really fast over here, the black dots. The red dots are really slow. So if you're reading a file over the network, 
you have four orders of magnitude roughly. I'm totally uh, rounding up a lot. But you have a, a lot of time to process the data. Um, the data comes in, and you process it, and then you wait around for like a year. Then the next chunk comes in, you process it, you wait around for a year. This is why Node is so fast, is it can process things when they come in and wait for slow I.O. If I.O. is really fast, Node would probably not be that fast. Um, luckily, we live in a world where I.O. is slow. So, um, for instance, uh, if you request a 9 gigabyte or 9 billion gigabyte uh, gzipped file, that's some big data. That's like all of Google plus Facebook. Um, and you pipe that into Node's uh, Zlib library, which is in Node Core, um, and you create a gunzip stream. Create gunzip returns a stream that when you write gzip data to it, it doesn't wait for the full file. If you had to wait for 9 billion gigabytes of data to download, A, Node would crash, and B, um, it would never finish. But if you start reading the file into Node and you create a gunzip stream, Node will start giving you data right away. As soon as data arrives, it'll gzip the first bit. Gzip is designed to be a streaming protocol. Um, Zlib also works with buffers. So there's, it tries to not convert to string because that's slow. It tries to ungzip as fast as possible by not converting between buffers and strings. And all streams in Node Core emit buffers, so buffers are good and fast, but harder to use. Um, I just want to take a quick caveat. For, for looking this stuff up afterwards, npm search, um, what I would recommend is look up some of these things, like relevant prefixes. I like to describe npm in terms of prefixes. People complain that npm is one flat namespace, but you can hyphenate things. Um, so level dash, just npm search for things that have level in the name, or level, dot, level db, or level dash. That's kind of a, a common prefix. Um, a lot of these use buffers because databases need to be fast. ND array is the multidimensional array stuff. There's a ton of amazing, mind-blowing ND array stuff, from 3D morphology to image manipulation, Photoshop style functions. Um, totally really fun, kind of mind-expanding modules. Um, and then anything that ends in dash stream means it'll generally be fast and usually work with buffers. Um, so if you use the command line version of npm search, you get a lot of data, and it's kind of nice for getting like a high-level view. But you have to read the code of node modules. And that's how you determine if a node module is good or not. If you can't read the code, and uh, you know, once you get familiar with the concepts, you shouldn't really be um, scared to read the code, because most, most node module authors that are worth their weight in salt use the community conventions. So once you learn things like buffers, streams, events, you know, all these kind of node core fundamentals, you should be able to go into pretty much any good module in NPM and not be totally confused. Um, there are some people experimenting with more fringe ideas, but you know, those are good too. But most modules should be consumable. They should be like a candy bar. You know, it's like, it shouldn't take that long to get through it. Um, and you get a little rush after you understand or whatever. So like, read the code. Don't look at like, the GitHub issues at first. Don't read how many stars it has. Don't read for blog posts. Open up index.js or whatever the main thing is and read through it. And if you're like, wow, this looks like total like a C++ programmer that puts their brackets in the wrong place, it's probably not a high quality module because that means that nobody else has sent them a pull request and complained about it and they haven't adopted the standards of the community and things like that. So read the code. That's my, my rant. Um, so really quickly to finish up, um, the reason I'm doing all this stuff is I'm working on a project called DAT that's built on LevelDB and Node. Um, and the reason I'm doing it in Node is because of NPM. Um, there's a lot of people that publish data, like governments are opening data. I've worked in that sector for a long time. A lot of scientific researchers want to share data, like when the Large Hadron Collider comes up with new data, they want to be able to sync it out to all the researchers in different parts of the world. Um, but everybody uses different formats, and everybody different, uses different programming languages. So what I want is to have anybody will be able to be able to write a node module to support a format or a database, and then provide a, a like a command line API like Unix streams that you can pipe to a Python process or you can pipe to a Ruby process, and kind of just like use npm's modularity to support all the formats under the sun, so we can all stop reinventing the wheel in different communities. Um, so I got some grant funding to work on this, and. I really like LevelDB because it lets me pick all the different trade-offs at all the different levels, but it also has to be really fast. And so I've been doing a lot of work with optimizing the speed, and I, I'm really excited about all the possibilities of binary data in the browser and in Node. Um, I also want to do fast sync and update, um, so it needs to be streaming. So the, there's no other package manager in the world that has as many streaming modules. Um, like the, basically, the reason I switched to Node was because I couldn't do two file uploads at the same time in one Ruby process. I was doing Ruby, and I was like, why, is my, why, why do most places limit the size of file uploads? That seems silly. Like, I wanted to have no limit on file uploads. And I was like, oh, Node does that. There's other things that do it, but Node has the best package manager. It makes it the easiest. Um, and so now, three years later after I got into Node, there's like 
too many streaming modules for me to even know about. Um, so it's really exciting. And this is the thing that I've been working on, like one of the examples. So when you hear the term back pressure, what it means is, so for instance, this is this flight data. This is like 100, or this one's like 20 million flights in a 120 megabyte CSV that's bzipped. So when you deflate it, it's like, you can convert it to JSON. It's like three gigabytes of JSON. So I, I, on the command line, I have a dat command, and I also have this line delimited JSON parser that converts line delimited JSON to CSV, or CSV to line delimited JSON. So I pipe CSV into it, converts it to JSON objects, and it puts it in the database. Um, the really important thing here is back pressure. So when I don't want to overload the database, like in the example, this cup is the database, and I don't want the cup to get too much water because it'll overflow. I'll get a over buffer override or whatever. Um, so if, if I'm not able to write as much data into the cup, I want to respect how much, cup, how much water the cup can hold because um, people only drink water so fast. So I don't want to write too much data, so I have to tell this side of the stream that's giving me the data, hey, they don't need water right now. Um, slow down a little bit, just like a garden hose. So um, these pipes are really important because it goes, it, the data comes left to right, but when it gets to my thing, which is the database, um, I can only write so much data. You can't write infinite amounts of data. It, there's limits on hardware. So when I'm writing too much data, I need to tell the CSV module, which needs to tell the BZIP module, which needs to tell curl, which needs to send TCP back pressure signals to the server or whatever. However that magic works inside of Node, you just have to tell Node uh, using pipes. This is why streams are awesome. Is If you tell Node, like you're giving me too, too much data, Node will make sure your process won't crash and won't run out of RAM. If you don't use streams, you'll probably mess up and allocate too many buffers because you won't be able to write all the buffers to the file system and you'll create too many buffers and then your process will crash. But if you use streams, usually Node will make sure that, you know, there's margins of error, but Node will make sure your process won't crash. This is what Isaac tells me. Um, <laughs> so that's what back pressure means. It means if you can't write fast enough to something, make sure you use streams so that the signals uh, propagate to the file system or to TCP so that you don't run out of memory. This is also the last demo I'm going to do because uh, it's really awesome, um, and then I'll be done. But um, this is an ND array module that Substack wrote that analyzes an MP3, starts a, a web server, so opens up Chrome, and then visualizes it using a fast Fourier transform ND array module. Um, so if I go to the command line and run this, so what it does is it, um, this is actually an R. Kelly song, uh, I Believe I Can Fly, um, one of the anthems of America. And it, it analyzes the spectrum of the song. It's parsing the MP3 and then generating an ND array, uh, putting the, the song data into an ND array, and then using a fast Fourier transform to show you the spectrogram analysis. Um, and there, so there's, I just wanted to show you a really cool demo that Substack did, because I didn't know if he was going to show it off. So I'd steal his thunder a little bit. But it's super fun stuff. Like binary data is multimedia and what makes programming really fun. So get into binary um, and play with binary stuff more often. Uh, so thank you.